Welcome to Access Rhode Island and its program, Kids Count. My name is Elizabeth Burke Bryant, Executive Director of Rhode Island Kids Count, a children's policy and advocacy organization that works to improve the health, education, economic well-being, and safety of Rhode Island's children. For each Access Rhode Island program, we have the opportunity to focus in on a really critical issue facing children, youth, and families. And today's program is a very, very exciting and important one, and it has to do with children with developmental delays and disabilities. Rhode Island Kids Count had the pleasure of being able to produce a brand new issue brief called Young Children with Developmental Delays and Disabilities. It was released just this month at a great policy roundtable held at Hasbro Children's Hospital with a lot of people from around our community who care about giving children the best possible start in life. And we are so fortunate to have on the program today two people who were at the policy roundtable and we're very excited to introduce them to you now. Our first guest on my left is Dr. Yvette Yachmink. She is Associate Professor of Pediatrics for Hasbro Children's Hospital. And Dr. Yachmink is also a developmental behavioral pediatrician at the Children's Neurodevelopment Center. Yvette, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And on her right and my left is Eileen Howard Boone. Eileen is the Senior Vice President of Corporate, so of, of, I'm sorry, let me start your fabulous title again. <laughs> Senior Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility and Philanthropy at CVS Caremark. Welcome, Eileen. Thanks so much for having me, Elizabeth. Well, I really would love to start with you, Eileen. We are so, so uh, thankful at Rhode Island Kids Count that first of all, CVS Caremark has this issue so clearly on your radar screen. It really has been a signature issue of CVS Caremark for many years, and I'll have you say a few words about that. Sure. And in particular, we're very grateful for the support you provided to Rhode Island Kids Count to not only release this issue brief, but also to add a new indicator to our annual Kids Count fact book on children uh, in preschool special education. And both really are brand new resources for the community. So thank you so much for that support and your ongoing working partnership. Well, we were really happy to do it. And it's important very much, particularly here in our home state, to make sure that we can really give all the opportunity to improve children's lives here in Rhode Island. And it really reflects our commitment in Rhode Island to a program we call All Kids Can that we started about seven years ago and it was really dedicated to help children of all abilities be the best that they can be and it's a total of 60 million dollars we've invested over seven years and 20 million lives that we've impacted and what we've learned throughout the, that period of time is how important early childhood development is and the opportunities for screening developmental screenings and how critical they are to the longer term life of, of our children particularly here in the state of Rhode Island. Well that was it's all children can or all kids can? All kids can. All kids can and that was just really I, I remember the process that you went through you really did um, a very thoughtful process of looking at at all of the many issues that CVS Caremark might involve itself in um, and sort of sitting where you sit and with the reach that you have this issue really rose to the top and that's because it's it's, it's a huge difference that you can make if you go in early, right? Absolutely. I mean, children's have, children have always been at the heart of our philanthropic focus. And when we did all of our research to find out what was an important opportunity for us to play a role in, we could bring not only monetary support, but volunteerism and awareness and strategic counsel. This opportunity for helping children at the early stages really spoke to us. It is a very uncluttered space when it talks about people that are strong advocates as a vet uh, knows strong advocates for this and the opportunities that really provide for children when you get in early I'm a parent myself get in early uh, the difference it can make to the quality of that child's development and the relationship they have with their parents and their siblings and you know you and I have talked about this um, as we've known each other over the years is it just amazing and exciting how many families this issue touches I bet you're known for this CVS Caremark is known for this you're a mother of children yourself when you go out and about um, when people are healthy Helped when their child is identified for some intervention, if they have a developmental delay or disability, they learn so much so quickly and they feel like part of almost this extended family of people who get it. Do you find that in both your work and your life? Absolutely. I, this is really a moment of awareness and learning for a new parent, particularly for a new parent who really 
needs to understand those those opportunities for that child to develop and to grow into a successful human being and being the very best they can be. That's a phrase we use often. And when I talk to parents, particularly newly diagnosed parents of, of for newly diagnosed children, or just children within an inclusive classroom, the opportunities that it has for parents and their siblings particularly um, when you think about the parents are also talking about their sibs and the opportunities it provides to understand what a child is going through and then how to develop coping mechanisms, how to develop opportunities for really for them to achieve the very best that, again, I'm repeating myself, the very best that they can be because it's wonderful, particularly in opportunities that we've had across the country to build inclusive playgrounds. You know, it's not surprising to anyone that the, that the top of the play structure is the place where all kids want to be. Yes. But how difficult it is for children with disabilities at times to get to the top of the play structure. To, to create this inclusive playground to allow all children to get there and to play together side by side not only helps that typically developed child, but also the one that's managing through mm -hmm. developmental delays or disabilities. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to talk to any child, any parent across the country, they're dealing with the same types of things. Well, and that's a great way to transition now because it is, it's, it's, it's nearly universal, the, the touch and, and the, the sharing that can occur when people have been through this. And, and in a minute, we'll talk to both of you about what it means for first time parents who yes. don't have that kind of experience yet. So Yvette, do you mind if I call you Yvette? Please it's do. It's great to have a pediatrician on board. Um, I'd like to sort of start out with just a common sense of language. Um, we called our issue brief and you were so helpful as were so many of our partners giving us data and information for this. But we call it young children with developmental delays and disabilities. Mm -hmm. About how many children in the United States have um, a developmental disability? What's about the average? Data has shown that approximately 15% of the children in the United States have some sort of developmental disability. Over over the course of their lives. And what is the difference? I know there's two terms, developmental delays mm -hmm. and developmental disabilities. If you could share with us mm -hmm. and our, our audience what the difference is and what sure. parents should know about those individual terms. A delay is when a child doesn't reach certain milestones at the same time as other children their age. Um, and those are milestones in the areas of motor development, like walking, um, fine motor skills, like um, feeding themselves with a spoon uh, in language. That's a real common one, understanding and using language in social skills and emotional skills and self-help skills. A disability is usually diagnosed later. So young children, um, and in Rhode Island, the definition of delay for educational purposes can um, remain until age eight. Um, but if a child continues to be behind their peers and not catch up after age eight, then we call it a disability, or if they have some set difficulty that is with them for life. And in terms of risk factors, I know that one of the universal uh, aspects of this issue is that a family can have a few different children and um, no experience with this issue and then have a child that does have a developmental delay or disability. Mm -hmm. But are there certain risk factors that make mm -hmm. children even more at risk for developmental delays or disabilities? Absolutely. So we often see children who have a known chromosome abnormality or a hearing impairment or some other sensory impairment that causes a developmental disability. But the big um, thing that many people are unaware of are the, the social and environmental factors that can contribute to significant delays and disabilities over a lifetime. Poverty and other things that we call toxic stress, so child abuse and exposure to um, parents with significant mental health issues and um, parents who are using um, drugs and alcohol, all of those things, uh, the more of those risk factors that, you, that a child is exposed to, the more likely they are to have a long-term developmental delay or disability. 
Well, and just one more question just to sort of set the stage. When we're talking about individual developmental disabilities, I know that just for purposes of trying to put, put the numbers in a reasonable framework, um, and, I, and I should say that my colleague Leanne Barrett at Rhode Island Kids Count did a terrific job with this issue brief, mm -hmm. working really tirelessly on it and really mining all of that data and finding even more. But if you could just give us a breakdown of the, the common sort of pie slices of what types of developmental disabilities you typically see? So we see children, so in Rhode Island, um, children who are in early intervention, um, th these are young children, children up to age three, can receive supports based on um, an established diagnosis that we know can lead to a developmental disability such as uh, Down syndrome or autism. Um, then there are children who are just delayed in more than one or more than one area of development. And then there are children who are at risk because of socioeconomic um, factors. Um, and the children who are at risk don't necessarily qualify for services, but those are really the children who benefit the most from those kinds of interventions and who we really should be targeting. Right. Well, and, and I want to bring it over to Eileen because I know that one of your real hallmarks of your work has been the notion of finding these issues early right. so that we know from all of the research and um, from studies that have been done that the earlier the better. Right. Um, and so I know that there's a whole host of ways that Rhode Island really leads the way in terms of the universal screening that we have, um, starting at birth, and going on in life. So mm -hmm. Yvette, why don't we start with you in terms of, we have the family outreach program and that's something early. There's also the screening that happens at birth that's where your right. child receives an APGAR score, even I remember that. Mm -hmm. um, so do you just want to take us a few, through a few things and then I want to have Eileen touch on the, the contribution CVS has mm -hmm. made to be sure Great. parents understand right. these milestones. So why don't we start with you? So um, that APGAR score is the, <laughs> Actually, not the first screen. The first screens happen during pregnancy. Okay. All the um, uh, neonatal and perinatal screens that happen. But then at birth, um, you, many mothers probably remember that little heel stick, that first blood sample. Um, at that time, we screen for a variety of um, congenital abnormalities, things that children are born with that if we intervene early enough, things like um, PKU or congenital hypothyroidism, if we intervene medically at an early age, we can prevent long-term problems. Um, we also, in Rhode Island, have universal newborn hearing screens, and that's really essential to identify those children as early as possible in order to provide them with a means of communication. Um, then the next big point for screening is in the pediatrician's office. And um, we, we have some work to do in that. The issue brief has sort of summarized that um, not all pediatricians are doing universal screening, but it is, has improved over the last few years. In 2006, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended um, universal screening for general developmental problems as well as universal screening for autism. And, there, and now that is happening more frequently, although we don't have great data yet on what percentage of pediatricians in Rhode Island are actually doing screening, but we're going to have that data because Rhode Island has a great system for collecting information about every child who's born in the state through the pediatrician's office and they are going to be including information about developmental screening which I think is wonderful because the pediatrician has so many opportunities to meet a child during those first uh, three years of life you know that you many of you probably know that you come in first at two weeks and two months and four months and six months and for all those immunizations. And the other really important thing is the developmental screening that goes on there. Another avenue for screening is through child outreach. So for children age three, four, and five, every town um, has a, 
child outreach program to screen children for um, developmental problems and for preschool. So there's lots of opportunities, but we can still always do better. And where do those child outreach um, screenings take place? Those take place in the towns through the public school department, and children are screened to see if they um, can go on to a preschool program and, and prior to kindergarten. Well, um, it's been very exciting to follow the, some of the decisions that have been made in Rhode Island, and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, endorsed something called Bright Futures, which is what they call the gold standard of developmental screening, mm -hmm. with the frequency and intensity that really sort of digs in deep and really tries to spot mm -hmm. things um, in terms of the, the sophistication and the detail of it. And then, as you say, we have KidsNet, which is a comprehensive database on children's health and development. Mm -hmm. And we have been involved with the Rhode Island Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, and that's bringing $50 million over four years for a whole variety of things to do with improving our early learning system. And one of the ones I'm most excited about is that it will connect the dots between the KidsNet Child De Health and De Development Database and the longitudinal data system being built out at the Department of Education because we all know education and health go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So Eileen, I know that you know, we've talked about what pediatricians are doing. What about parents? Um, what are the tools that the parents really need to be able to, if they were say, say to you, Eileen, I just really feel like I don't know what I'm doing. How will I know whether my child has met certain milestones? What would you tell them? Well, I think any parent dealing with a child with, with delays or, or developmental disabilities really is lucky to be in the state of Rhode Island because as Yvette talked about, we do have very comprehensive programs in the state, but parents have to be part of that equation as well. And so we learned that over a variety of different programs and, and looked for a tool to help parents understand particularly first-time parents, where a child should be at a particular month or time, time zone and, or time slot. And we found Ages and Stages, which is a program um, and a questionnaire that lots of, of um, uh, early childhood experts use. And we found a way to fund that as an online tool for parents and actually just most recently converted it to Spanish. So here in our home state of, of Rhode Island, we have a very large Hispanic population, so it's a great tool for parents. And I, I talk to clinicians and pediatricians all the time in the state and how happy they are that we've funded the program because it is a wonderful opportunity for parents to really learn and use that tool when they go to their ped pediatrician, whether they have um, surveys or, or online tools or not, to say, I've done this, and here's what I'm noticing. Am I right? Am I wrong? How can I help Johnny be the very best that they can be? And so if parents are watching now, how can they access that tool? Well, they can go onto the Easter Seals website and the Ages and Stages website. So both of them just go through Bing, Google, you name it, um, look those up. And it's Ages and Stages as well as Easter Seals. And you can find those opportunities on there. So the online questionnaire. And then there's lots of tools and tricks that you can do to find more information as well. And so you've made sure um, that this is getting around much more broadly than it would have without your efforts. Yeah, we funded a grant that actually makes it free online, so any parent can t access it at any time, and you can use it as the child grows. So as, as the child is developing, you can use that questionnaire all along that child. Zero to five is such a critical time that we wanted to make sure that there was always opportunities for parents to weigh in and to be active participants in their child's development. Well, I'm sure this is music to your ears, Yvette. Because what is more fun and more workable than educated parents? That's because then you're right. real partners in child health and development. That is so true. And the Ages and Stages is a fabulous tool. I'm so glad that that's the one that you chose because it really um, it has a lot of detailed information at various um, ages and from birth to five. And it really helps parents understand what expectations there are at each age for their child and when to be concerned and when to bring that concern to a pediatrician. So it's one of the best tools out there for an overall general developmental screen and yeah. we highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that's the one you've chosen. That's the one we chose. And I'm sure one of the things that it does is that it explains to parents that developmental tra trajectories for all of our children are sometimes on different timetables and that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So when your child is, is crawling, when your child's rolling over, when your child's beginning 
beginning to walk, and it probably gives you ranges of times to be mm -hmm. looking at in terms of ages and stages? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It will give you guidelines to where you should be watching and then where you should engage. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a whole range, because not one child's doing it the exact same way. I have a lot of children myself, and I know when someone's delayed and someone's right. not. Mm -hmm. Some, when, my teenagers, I don't know so much if they're they're skipping through some things, but um, but no, That's it really age. It, it does give you ranges and opportunities to really engage with your your clinicians because in some cases it just might be a timing issue. Mm -hmm. Well, well, this has been a great introduction to the topic, and now I think we're going to shift to some of the kinds of programs and policies that families might have mm -hmm. heard but don't know too much about. And the first um, that I'd like to start with is early intervention. Mm -hmm. Early intervention is just a real Really, really important program because it is available to families that qualify and um, it has really been made to be something that is easy to find out about and easy to access and I just um, want to start with you Yvette I wanted to jot down a few numbers um, about 12 percent of Rhode Island children are enrolled in early intervention mm -hmm. which is a program that start that serves children 0 to 3 is mm -hmm. that right that's correct and that amounts to about 3,000 uh, 3,967 Rhode Island children. About. Just about. You know, we kind of just do this number cranking at Kids Count and we come up with um, approximate lum mm -hmm. numbers like 3,967. And so why don't you just tell us a little bit about early intervention. Um, I assume that this is a, a program that is available to children all around the country. It is. it is. Yes. It's a national program. There's actually a federal mandate under, under the um, individual for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that mandates services, but there are different definitions of who qualifies for early intervention across the country, so that for some states, the re requirements are much more stringent than for others. Rhode Island is sort of in the middle, so there are six states in the country that allow children who are just at risk for developmental problems to enroll in early intervention. Our neighbor north of us, Massachusetts, enrolls children who are at risk. Rhode Island doesn't enroll children who are at risk, um, but it has always had a, a category called multiple established um, conditions, which is kind of an equivalent to at risk, but as of just this month, that category is no longer uh, yeah. a category for early intervention, which is really a shame. They have opened it up to more cl clinical judgment on the part of early intervention providers, and hopefully that will capture some of the at-risk children. But we know that those children who are at risk, who are, live in poverty and are exposed to all those things that we call toxic stress, are really at greatest risk and really would benefit the most because the early intervention model is really all about empowering parents to provide the best developmental and social environment for their children. And that's really, it's, it's in the home for the most part and it's really teaching parents how to work with their children and bring out the best in them. And children who are at risk are the ones um, whose parents often really can benefit a lot from that model. Because they don't have to be held up. Because in some cases you have a developmental delay, you can manage through it, right? I mm -hmm. think that's the, one of the, the greatest right. good news that we have in early intervention. It's a fantastic program and it really can provide so much help and support for a child. Um, and they don't have to be held back. They don't have to be in a situation you know, th that you would ever even know years mm -hmm. later that they had early intervention. Well, that's a really good point, Eileen, because you know, why wait for something to escalate and then right. be very, very apparent if right. you can get in early. I think that's really exactly. a wise point. And one of the recommendations that we make as Rhode Island Kids Count is that the, the state consider um, the at-risk definition like our neighbor to the north, Massachusetts, especially as we um, remove the multiple um, established. established conditions. So um, we'll be watching that carefully mm -hmm. and continuing to make that recommendation. I have to say that EI has really a great way of connecting with community leaders. They have um, the ICC, which is a group of, of people who were involved in this issue that inform their policies and we'll be watching it carefully and participating all along the way. Um, so the next, uh, when we think about the chronological growth of children, mm -hmm. then they hit their preschool years. That's and right. we have preschool special ed, and mm -hmm. I happen to have an approximate figure on that too. 
Um, about 15 percent, um, I'm sorry, about 7 percent of Rhode Island's children are in preschool special ed and that is 2,000 565 young children. Mm -hmm. And so that's ages three through five, three through kindergarten entry. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's correct. And um, w when are those services needed? And is it true that you have some children that are in preschool special ed that then catch up to their typically developing peers and then they go into the regular school program? Yes. So interestingly, um, not quite as many children who are in early intervention end up in preschool special ed. But then if you look at the later data about how many children in the state are in special education, that's anywhere between 18 and 20 percent of children. Mm -hmm. So what's happening there? Why are we serving all these children? Then there's a gap. Um, there's fewer children in preschool special ed and then many more children in, in special education later on. That's the piece that concerns me. Why are we missing all of these children? Often children get referred. So early intervention transitions children to preschool special ed programs. But there's some great disparities around the state in how um, available those preschool services are for children. We have many children who um, are deemed not eligible because the eligibility requirements for early intervention in preschool special ed are quite different. We also have children who are just given um, walk-in services. For example, they get a half an hour of speech therapy a week, um, which um, is helpful. But since we know that all children benefit from a high quality preschool experience and children with delays and disabilities especially benefit from a preschool experience with their typically developing peers in what's called an inclusion model. We know that's, you've talked about inclusion right. on the playground, but there's lots and lots of data out there to say that really for children with delays and disabilities the best way for them to learn is with their Absolutely. typically developing peers. Absolutely. Um, and there's uh, there, there's some data in there about the number of children who are in inclusion preschools and it's less than half of the children who go on to um, preschool services are in inclusion preschools in Rhode Island and that's something we really need to work on because that is so essential. Um, the other piece of the data that's in there that's a, a little concerning is that there is a smaller percentage of children in the four core cities. So we have the core cities of Rhode Island are um, Providence, Central Falls, Pawtucket, and Woonsocket, where the greatest pockets of poverty are. And those um, cities have a smaller percentage of children in preschool special education than um, in the more affluent communities in Rhode Island. But again, we know that it's those children who are living in poverty who really are in most need of those support services in, at an early age and who most benefit from it. Well, I can't believe our time has flown. And Eileen, I'm going to turn to you for a last word. This has been such an illuminating uh, piece of work that CVS Caremark has made possible. And so do you have any final thoughts as we move forward and think about our long-term educational goals about why this matters so much? Well, I think this is a question of return on social impact and social investing and, and really investment in our state and, the, and our next generation of Rhode Islanders. I want to thank Kids Count uh, in particular for investing the time and energy into this very important um, you know, issue. And I would say I'm lucky to be a Rhode Islander because we do really have an enormous amount of folks that are dedicated, like Yvette here, dedicated to children and advocates for children and children's well-being. And we count ourselves among that and we feel very, very happy to participate. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the program. It's just been a whirlwind of a conversation. Thank you for what you do every single day for the children of Rhode Island. And thank you so much for joining us for Access Rhode Island and its program, Kids Count.